get more details about that soon. But ladies, I want to give you a, a personal invite to our study this, this semester. We will meet Sunday nights or Tuesday mornings. Uh, and this semester, guys, when you sign up, you'll get kind of this little bundle here. And what, what's in it is our study guide and then two books that we're going to be uh, reading portions of. And instead of doing a specific book of the Bible like we have always done, we are going to be studying the attributes of God, which sounds fancy, but really all that means is we are saying, who is God? What is God like? And why is that good news for us? And so to get into our Bibles, we will be pairing each trait of God with a Bible character and looking into their story and portions of their text. I am really, really excited. It's going to be different, fresh, new. We're going to have a little bit more of a classroom feel. So if you are new and you are wanting to get to know people, this is a great place to do it because you're just going to be sitting at a table with seven other women. You'll have a leader. There's going to be lots of opportunity for uh, getting to know uh, other people as well as digging really deep into God's word. So I hope that uh, you will consider doing that. Uh, if, if you need me to talk you into it, come find me in the foyer. Um, but we start in two weeks, Sunday nights and Tuesday mornings. All right, well, we are going to jump into Genesis now. Uh, for our, our second week, Mark's going to uh, lead us into the first part of Genesis 1. All right, if you have a Bible, would you open it or turn it on to Genesis 1? We're going to be going on a journey through the Bible this year, starting here in Genesis, page 1 of the Bible. Genesis is fall and Revelation uh, next semester in the spring semester, so we're Super excited about that. We are going to read the first 25 verses of uh, Genesis 1. This is God's word as we read. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths. And the spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. There was an evening, and there was a morning, one day. Then God said, let there be an expanse between the waters, separating water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above the expanse, and it was so. God called the expanse sky, evening came, and then morning, the second day. Then God said, let the water under the sky be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the gathering of the water he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and fruit trees on the earth, bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And it was so. The earth produced vegetation, seed-bearing plants according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Evening came, and then morning, the third day. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. They will serve as signs for seasons and for days and years. They will be lights in the expanse of the sky to provide light on the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule over the day and the lesser light to rule over the night as well as the stars. God placed them in the expanse of the sky to provide light on the earth to rule the day from the night and the night and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. Evening came and then morning, the fourth day. Then God said, let the water swarm with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the large sea creatures and every living creature that moves and swarms in the water according to their kinds. He also created every winged creature according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them. Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the waters of the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. Evening came, and then morning, the fifth day. Then God said, let the earth produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestocks, 
creatures that crawl, and the wildlife of the earth according to their kinds, and it was so. So God made the wildlife of the earth according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that crawl on the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. On April 12th, 1961, Yuri Gagarin, the Russian cosmonaut, became the first human to travel into space and orbit the earth. Gagarin said in flight, I don't see any God up here. These words just hanging in the expanse of the cosmos. First human to see the glory of creation, unable to see God. What do you say to that? What do you say to the skeptic who says, zoom out as far as you want, no evidence of God. Zoom in to the subatomic level and all you'll see is randomness, quantum physics. There's no evidence of God here. What do you say? Well, Romans 1 tells us that God's invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. The Bible is telling us that God reveals himself through nature. So the question, as we just read Genesis 1 and as we work through this text, is what does nature reveal about God? What are those attributes of God that we see revealed in nature? Well, it begins verse 1-1, these four words, in the beginning, God. The unmistakable subject of this story that we're about to read is God. 30 times, over 30 times in chapter 1 alone, God, 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 God speaks, God placed, God said, God is the main subject of this story, and we see that in the beginning, God, he's there. The first thing we want to learn about God is that God is self-existent. He is eternal and depends on no one. There is an explanation for the origin of trees. A seed was planted and a tree came up. There's an explanation for humans, egg and sperm. A human is conceived. But not God. He does not depend on any cause for his existence. So why then would this God who's self-sufficient create the world? We'll get to that later, but there he is. In the beginning, God, and the first verb that describes what God did was, in the beginning, God, what? He created. The most fundamental thing you need to know about God is that God is creator. He created the heavens and the earth. This is kind of a summary of the first six days here, that statement there. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths. So by this time, God has, has brought the raw materials into existence. And now it says that it's formless, it's empty. This idea in Hebrew is that it's, it's, there's sort of a chaos and disorder to it. If you've taken Gospel 101, uh, Jeff Dodge writes in there about the Hebrew words tohu wobohu. It's, it's chaos, desolation, disorder, whatever words you want to use there. And so God gets to work designing, shaping, placing. In verse 3, God said, let there be light and there 
was light. The second thing to know about God is that God is creator. He is the author and designer of everything. One of the most basic fundamental questions you can ask is, how did we get here? Where did we come from? We've been asking this question from the beginning of time as humans, and this is in studying philosophy in college. This is what Aristotle said. There must be an immortal, unchanging being ultimately responsible for all wholeness and orderliness in the sensible world. That's over 2,300 years ago. What he observed, Aristotle observed, is that every effect has a cause. If the paper goes off the music stand here, you will know that there was a cause, right? It just didn't magically move. There was a, there was a hand that moved the paper, right? Every effect has a cause. And, or if I'm just standing here and the paper just falls off, you would assume there's wind that you couldn't see that pushed the paper. This is what Aristotle is saying. And he, he looks at the universe and he says, there must be a first cause. And he called this first cause the unmoved mover, Like everything's being moved by something that you can see or explain. There has to be something, a mover that's outside of all of this. And here we see in Genesis 1, let there be light. Let there be light. So behind this is God, the unmoved mover. Okay. So I have a light here. I'm going to say a command Let there be light. And there was light. Look at my power that I have within me. And you're like, well, yeah, where does that light come from? And I'm like, this light comes from a battery in the phone. Like, yeah, I know. Where does that battery get its energy from? Well, I plugged it into that outlet over there and I charged my battery. So the power energy comes from that outlet. Well, where does that energy come from? Well, there's like a long wire. It's kind of almost like an extension cord uh, that goes like in like through the walls or maybe underground. And it goes to a little uh, room over there. There's a panel. That's where the power comes from. Like, well, where does that power come from? Well, there's another really long extension cord that kind of goes under the ground and over to a, a pole over there. It comes from the pole. Where does that come from? Well, another long extension cord goes all the way to the power station. And that's where the power comes from. Well, where does that power come from, from the power station? Well, see, let me explain. There's a lot of energy sources. I mean, coal is one. We have nuclear power. So maybe uranium, uh, also solar power. You know, Where does that energy come from? Well, the sun, it's kind of like a big nuclear reaction going on. Nuclear fusion, you can ask a scientist about it, but but it's like a big nuclear reactor up there that's like powering these solar panels and all the energy and the extension cords. And and, well, where does that come from? Well, it's kind of like there's another long invisible extension cord that goes way out into space. You know where the stars are formed, black holes and all that stuff. Yeah, where does that energy come from? Well, there's another long extension cord. If you've studied biology, right, the extension cords just keep going back forever. Just add billions of extension cords and you can totally explain the light. Okay. The question is, yes. But somewhere, it's plugged into something, as it were. Somehow, something generated something that enables this light to be powered, this little light of mine here, right? Uh, So, something can't just come from nothing. And we know this, that when we study the universe, we can transform things. But we can never create or destroy something. Oh, I can burn it. Oh, it just turns the energy into a different form. 
but you've never met a scientist who created their own dirt, as one preacher said, right? That's just taking objects that have already been created and transforming them. So we see here in Genesis 1 that this energy source is not just an impersonal force, not just some impersonal unmoved mover. Behind it is God saying it, speaking it, willing it, like an author who puts a pen to the paper and creates a story, God is creating the story of the universe, speaking this story into existence. After this Russian cosmonaut returned from space and reported that he had not found God, C.S. Lewis' response to this is, oh yeah, that's like Hamlet going into the attic of the castle trying to find Shakespeare. He just couldn't find him anywhere. Shakespeare is the author of the story. He wrote Hamlet into this story. Hamlet's looking all over the castle, can't find Shakespeare. That, the modern day equivalent, uh, for those of you that don't know Shakespeare, would be like Luke Skywalker was looking all over to all these planets and could not find George Lucas anywhere. So therefore, George Lucas does not exist. Of course not. He's the author writing the story. Day one. Let there be light. And there was light. The first day. Day two. Let there be an atmosphere separating waters. The mystery and wonder of that moment. Day three. Let there be an ocean Dirt, let there be wood and corn and mango trees and with seeds that will reproduce. Day four, let there be solar systems with magnetic fields. Let there be super giant galaxies with a hundred trillion stars. And that's not even a hyperbole. And the psalmist says he knows all the stars. He calls them by name. Day five, fish and birds. Let there be clownfish, great white sharks, cardinals. Google cool birds, and I found the rainbow lorikeet bird in this remote part of Indonesia. And I look at this bird, and I'm like, that's not even real. It's like the colors, like fluorescent and Beautiful colors that that I've never seen before. Only in like a little kid's crayon set that you're like, I've never seen that in the natural world. This is just beautiful. God is speaking these beautiful animals into existence. Birds, day six, animals, wildlife. Let there be Tyrannosaurus rex and giraffes. Have you ever seen a giraffe run? It looks like it should be in like something in Avatar, the movie, like some other, it's like other world. This thing, as it it moves, like what is that animal? Beautiful snow leopards. Chickens. Think about chickens. These creatures are amazing. Have you ever thought about a chicken? The thing eats everything. Just put it in, it just eats stuff out of the dirt. And then you can use the poop for compost. Like it's great fertilizer, right? Yeah, I said poop. I probably could have come up with a better word. It's just, I I mean, this chicken is amazing. I've been all over the world and I'm in all of these things. I've been to Morocco, been to remote parts of the Darien jungle in Panama, been into the, the bush of Africa. And guess what? Chickens are everywhere. They lay eggs and great protein. My kids were like, they met with coach and they're like, we want to work out. We want to do all this stuff. He's like, all right, eat eggs. They're great for protein. So eat a bunch of eggs from chickens. God invented that. Look at 
I want to zoom in on day four. Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The expanse proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour out speech. Night after night, they communicate knowledge. There's no speech. There are no words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their message has gone out to the whole earth in their words to the ends of the world. I was getting sermon help from my parents, phone a friend, right? And asking them, Genesis 1, what do you say? My mom said, Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. I love it. That word cosmos is the Greek word for order, beauty, cosmetics. What is cosmetics? It's bringing order and beauty to this chaos of my face. That's what cosmetics is. Or what's cosmetology? It's bringing order and beauty from this mess of hair, right? It's, it's shaping, making order out of chaos. This is what God is doing with creation. The cosmos, it's beautiful. It's designed intricately, fine-tuned. In 1990, the Hubble telescope was launched into orbit Being outside of the distortion of Earth's atmosphere, it was able to capture these extremely high-resolution images, allowing a deep view into space. And this famous 1995, this picture of 1995, it's called the Pillars of Creation. This is a vast star-forming region, 6,500 light-years away from Earth. The pillars that you see are giving birth to stars. The height of those pillars are about five light years tall. It's made of cold hydrogen gas laced with dust. The colors, oxygen is blue. The sulfur is orange, and the hydrogen and nitrogen is green, and God invented those elements that we see on the periodic table. God is a designer, like a cosmetologist bringing order and beauty, cutting hair, but he's creating galaxies. How did he do it? Proverbs 3 tells us, the Lord founded the earth by wisdom and establish the heavens by understanding. Let me paraphrase that. God is really smart. That's how he did it. By his knowledge, the watery depths broke open and the clouds dripped with dew. I have a question for you. Do you delight in God's creation? The world is ablaze with the glory of God. Do you see it? It's easy to miss the author. Here's how to do it. Keep looking down. Keep your earbuds in. Keep lots of noise running through your earbuds. Keep scrolling, keep swiping, and it's easy to miss God because you will almost never have to look up. Oh, and the stars, and it's kind of light pollution anyway, so don't, don't even bother looking up. You, you might see the Big Dipper, but that's about it. So just keep, keep scrolling. Keep the noise. Watch, make sure you watch a lot of good, like just a lot of good binging on, on Netflix and stuff is great for missing God, right? Because you just never have to. No, if you get nothing out of this except this one encouragement, put down the electronics 
and take a walk and look around and we are headed into fall and creation is about to be on fire with the glory of God. We went on a walk yesterday to Kent Park and we kind of took a couple of our kids and they were kicking and screaming. They didn't want to go. And once we got there, they were fine and they started exploring and they started finding little frogs. And I'm walking, I'm like, look at this leaf. It's like pink. I've never seen this before. Look at this thorn bush. It's giving like these bright purple, this bright purple flower. And the closer you get and you see the intricacy and the design, and it brings glory to God. And it's so good for the soul. I want to encourage you, young people especially, to study mathematics. Don't doze off. Pay attention in math. Why? Because math is the language of nature. Science. I hope we have some young scientists, curious people, because what is science but mapping out and tracing out the faithfulness of God to sustain the universe through laws of physics, biochemistry, let it just awaken awe. As you study your textbook and see the glory of God displayed in creation, discover, invent, put down electronics and go on a walk. And I've noticed with parenting, boredom always precedes creativity and wonder. Let your kids be bored, and they might find God. We think of all the verbs and actions of the creator here. God made, God placed, God separated, God called, God saw. Think of all the attributes of God just here. God saw, what's, he's omniscient, he sees everything. God placed, he's creative, he's I mean, we could go through and find so many attributes of God here, but look at verse 22. There's a new verb that's introduced to us in verse 22, right here. God, what? God blessed. Bless them. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the waters of the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. Evening came, then morning, the fifth day, verse 24, and God saw that it was good. This Hebrew word bless means to give happiness, to praise. And God saw that it was good. There was a sense of pleasure and delight. God is smiling at this point as he looks at his own genius of creativity and says, whoa, that's amazing. They're not going to discover this for like a few thousand years but when they do, it's going to blow their minds. Wait till they find this galaxy way out here. And he's so happy. Verse, uh, the, sorry, the, the third thing that I want you to write down about God and what we learn revealed through nature is that God overflows with happiness. God created you to share his joy. Why would a self-existent God make us? He doesn't need us. Why? I think this verb here in verse 22 gives a clue, and we'll talk more about this in the next couple weeks, but God blessed them. To me, there's a bigger problem in the universe than where does the energy to this light come from? Where does matter come from? There's a bigger problem to me, and that's how do you explain joy? How do you explain love? Prove to me, scientifically prove to me that you love your spouse or that you love your child or that you love your parents. Prove that. 
Prove to me that there's such a thing as justice. Where did justice come from? Why do we long for justice? We've never lived in a world where there's justice, where things are fair. Why do we want it? Where does it come from? What's the source of it? Why is there beauty? Why isn't everything just gray? God made you to be in awe. The difference between you and your dog when you go on a walk at Terry Trueblood or Kent Park or Yosemite or wherever it is, is that you have the capacity for awe and wonder. C.S. Lewis, in reflecting on this idea of, so how would a character in the story know the author? The only way that would be possible, the only way that Hamlet could really know Shakespeare or Luke Skywalker could know George Lucas is if the author wrote themselves into the story. And that's exactly what God did. John chapter one, verse one. Here it is, in the beginning. You see Genesis language here? In the beginning, God, well, John substitutes God for, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him. Apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. In him was life And that life was the light of men. The word became flesh, he says later, and dwelt among us. God wrote himself into the story, Jesus. Jesus is God. And life is generated through him. And we see him, he walks around, he touches a dead person, and they come to life. Remember the angels, when Jesus rolled up onto the scene as a baby, they said, joy to the world. The Lord has come. You have a soul and you are made for him. Do you know the author of the story this morning? Do you know the one who invented your life? Yuri Gagarin was flying his test test plane, his jet, in March of 1968, and it crashed, and he stepped into eternity and met his maker, the God he never knew. But just a few months later, on Christmas Eve, December 24th, 1968, three American astronauts Bill Anders, Jim Lovell, and Frank Borman were the first humans to travel to the moon. And as one-fourth of the world's entire population listened in, and they saw this sight, this was the picture that they took from the moon, the earth rise. And as they orbited the moon, the three of them took turns reading Genesis 1, 1 through 10. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. Let's pray together. The author of your story wants you to know him. I invite you to come this morning and just know that he's, he's drawing near to you through Christ, through the person of Jesus. He displayed his love not just with an abstract philosophy. He doesn't just shout down from heaven, 
I created you, I love you. No, he demonstrated his love. He died on a cross. And he's inviting you into his life, his resurrection. Let's worship him.
Veritas, go and you're pondering and you're marveling of our incredible and awesome God. Take a walk today. Enjoy the beautiful weather. We'll see you guys next week.